we would normally be having a, a, a lecture or seminar on the governance of security. Uh, our MSc program on the on security leadership and society in particular, uh, and the MSc program on leadership and development uh, benefits from a whole range of modules. One of which uh, is the governance of security. Uh, we then thought that as part of also a number of sessions that we have on the practice of leadership, we would take advantage of the fact that we have uh, not just an eminent scholar, but an, an eminent uh, practitioner, but also an alumnus of King's, who's just reflecting that he left King's uh, 21 years ago. I myself didn't realize that it's been that long uh, since he left King's. Uh, we thought that we'll take advantage of his presence in the UK to have him talk to our class. We then opened up that class to others at King's uh, and to people uh, outside of King's who are based uh, in London to come and listen to Dr. Kyle De Faremi, to everyone in our class. He needs no introduction. Uh, they've read up a lot about him. Uh, he was in the Department of War Studies here and studied this very subject uh, that uh, we're researching that is at the core of our program here at King's College London. Uh, the former governor of Ekiti State, Nigeria, uh, a time-tested and trusted colleague and friend. It's a pleasure to have you come here. I know that we've been wanting to bring you to King's in various capacities. The marketing uh, department might be around here somewhere wanting to talk to the alumnus to see <laughs> uh, how to engage differently. But it's a pleasure to have you, uh, Karadi. I know you always make time to talk to your students, so please uh, uh, come to take a seat. Thank you. Thank you for me, and um, let me um, thank some of my friends who are here. Um, I, I see of them, Richard Dowding, uh, Director of Real African Society, uh, Patrick Smith, Editor-in-Chief Africa Report, uh, and um, Dylan, well, Dylan, do you qualify to be a friend or an old colleague? You are, you are <laughs> all rolled into one, Dylan, and Rick Singh, who uh, was here. Uh, while I was still in the, the UK, and um, colleagues and friends, um, students in the uh, program. It really gives me uh, a great pleasure to be here um, this uh, evening. It's probably the first time that I've been back uh, on a formal engagement with um, uh, students in my own uh, old school and I won't quite say old department. I think uh, war studies has morphed into security and leadership, although I know war studies is still there. Uh, but you now have the whole range of other um, uh, affiliations to, to that. But for me, um, I, I, I was here uh, between 90 and 93. I left 1993 um, with a PhD in war studies, uh, specializing in civil military relations. Uh, and um, I've since gone on to uh, more foolish engagements in politics. Uh, <laughs> I, I ought to have stuck to uh, academic, pure and simple, but um, I, I deviated, went into politics, perhaps to uh, uh, learn more about the practical side of things uh, and um, I only just completed a, uh, a four year term in office as governor in um, one of our states in, in Ekiti and I'm actually here uh, uh, in the company of our presidential candidate who uh, came to address um, uh, the Chatham House uh, and um, people who are interested in the democratization process in, in Nigeria. So when Fumi suggested that it might not be a bad idea to come and uh, exchange ideas here, I, I felt it would be good too, since I haven't been back to do this in, in a while. 
I have been asked to talk about um, peace building, leadership, and democratic consolidation uh, uh, in Africa. And um, I, I was there at King's at a rather interesting time. If you look at that period I talked about, 1990 <coughs> to 93, that was the end of the Cold War. We were just getting out of the fall of the Berlin Wall when I came into the United uh, Kingdom. And at the time, really only four countries uh, had regular elections on the continent of Africa. And then in 90, we had the sovereign national conference in the Benin Republic, which opened the floodgates uh, uh, to electoral democracy uh, uh, on the continent. And since then, this last two and a half decades of democratization, um, the debate is still on whether the glass is half full or half empty, whether we are really uh, witnessing um, a deepening of democracy <coughs> on the continent, or we're witnessing a steady decline uh, of uh, <coughs> democratic governance on the continent. I mean, if you were to ask um, those who plot the graph at the Mo Ibrahim uh, governance index, for example, they will tell you that yes, on many of the uh, indicators that they think um, uh, good governance and democratization is on the decline on, on the continent, uh, even though they were ranked small countries as doing much better, at least on the governance index, maybe not on the uh, democratization index. So countries like Rwanda and uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone pre-Ebola uh, are the, the, the stars in, in, in the ranking of um, uh, uh, more Ibrahim index. Uh, if you if you take it further to Freedom House, uh, Freedom House would say that um, as a 2013 uh, countries that can be defined as free uh, in Africa has declined from 35 percent to uh, 41 uh, uh, percent in, in 2013, and a number of reversals have also been experienced, not the least what we've just seen in Burkina Faso. Uh, and that in itself presents an interesting conundrum. Uh, is Burkina Faso a reversal of democratization or a deepening of freedom? Uh, as we confront the whole issue of peace building, uh, I, I think that's one of the things that we need to return to, particularly in the context of the Constitutive Act of the African Union that obviously frowns at unconstitutional change of government on the continent and automatically wants to take uh, punitive action against countries where we have had on, on, on constitutional change of, of government. Uh, so if we look at whether the glass is half empty or half full, what we all can agree on is that um, democratization represents a case of uh, classic Gramscian case of the new it's clearly been born, uh, but the old is not fully dead. So we're caught in between, uh, in that transition between the old uh, uh, and the new. And it's not a surprise that that's the case. And if you look at some of the phases of development uh, in that period, era of structural adjustment, uh, political liberalization in the 90s. Um, we haven't quite, we've not had the big revolution of democratization in Africa. 
uh, and this is what has led to uh, measures that are more on the technical side of one electoral democracy, um, parliamentary strengthening, security sector reform, um, public sector reform, privatization, uh, all uh, issues that are clearly important in the deepening of, of, of democratization but cannot be seen uh, in discrete, independent uh, 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 isolation. But that clearly is what uh, watchers of political reform on the continent uh, are seeing. But what's the implication of that for peace building? We would also recall that I mean, peace building uh, is not really a new uh, uh, concept. I mean, it's the John Galtongian concept of, of, of the 70s and 80s, but it really came into reckoning with Bubu Gali uh, as uh, UN Secretary General uh, and his agenda for peace uh, was where an outline uh, was given of how uh, in the UN various peace support operations, uh, the idea of just stopping once peacekeeping ends and nothing follows becomes a, a, a critical challenge uh, uh, that had to be dealt with. And in the post-Cold War era, uh, Africa also became some laboratory for many of the peace building uh, activities that um, occurred. When Liberia went out and the international community was still pussyfooting around, Africa felt it needed to do something. And this was the uh, opportunity for ECOWAS to define itself. And it was at that state that ECOMOG came into uh, the peace-making, peacekeeping framework without any normative guidelines to it. I mean, ECO, ECO was went into it before uh, then going back to review its own treaty uh, to accommodate uh, intervention uh, in the form that it did as crisis response in, in Liberia and subsequently Sierra Leone. And um, uh, it then became uh, a, 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 a a subordinate partner, so to speak, to the United Nations in the quest to uh, uh, restore peace and order uh, in, in those countries. But clearly, when you look at the context within which all of that took place, regionalization of peace building did not come uh, uh, accidentally. It also was reacting to the fact that some of these conflicts were no longer intrastate. They're not also no longer interstate. They had become transnational. And when you look at the features of uh, uh, conflicts that we have on the continent today and reflect back 25 years, uh, that clearly is one of the most uh, uh, challenging things that the regional institutions and the United Nations have got to deal with, that these conflicts are no longer uh, conflicts between or within states. The, the conflicts that are peripheral, that are informal, or that are transnational. And you also need transnational tools uh, to deal with them and you need to then decide if it is a peace building approach what does a peace building approach mean and peace building has become an all commerce affair uh, it means everything to everybody uh, from disaster and relief operation to comprehensive post-conflict development uh, agenda, economic development uh, agenda. Uh, and I, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. As a matter of fact, my own position is that you do need peace building to 
uh, cover the entire chain but you need it to do that in a manner that it's properly defined the short term activities uh, medium term activities and, and long term activities and one of the things that has happened clearly over the last 25 years is that the norms and the conventions are there now and in fact you, you, there are many who would argue that we're probably even suffering from a surfeit of uh, of norms and uh, uh, security documents, the APSA is there, African Peace Security Architecture, the uh, mechanism, uh, conflict prevention mechanism is there at the lowest level. IGAD has its own, SADEC has its own. You have a whole range of uh, uh, norms, conventions, protocols that have been put in place, but that are not being fully utilized, uh, partly because of lack of commitment, but also, more importantly, lack of capacity <coughs> to uh, uh, implement uh, those uh, 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 norms and conventions that, that are there. But that trajectory has clearly improved from what it used to be. The United Nations is not the only player on the on the scene now, which is also why it's important for the UN uh, to look carefully at the notion of partnership and subsidiarity uh, that has dominated the thinking on peace building to accommodate um, the need for uh, complementarity and joined up strategy in which all partners take ownership of whatever uh, uh, agenda is being driven in particular conflicts, whether you're talking of uh, uh, the, the recent issues that we're dealing with now, I mean, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in uh, Kenya, Hakim, you name it. These are, or even Ebola which is a, it's a security governance issue, it's also a conflict uh, a management issue that um, uh, we all need to uh, reflect on because a, a, a question to ask clearly is how come Nigeria was able to effectively handle Ebola and Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea couldn't. That's a post-conflict issue and it's a peace building issue because the institutions that have enabled Nigeria to do much better in the management of Ebola are precisely the institutions that are missing in those three countries. Uh, and that is why when I said earlier that we must take the entire chain when we look at peace building uh, uh, rather than just the immediate post-conflict environment because the, the, what the theory tells us is that for peace building to be effective, it is most likely to happen in the immediate aftermath of conflict, which is really uh, the, the space for all manner of engagements, uh, both on the side of the international actors, on the side of the donors, and the readiness of an already weakened state makes it uh, responsive to peace building operations in the immediate aftermath uh, uh, of conflict but should that be the only period that peace building uh, becomes critical uh, I, I think not uh, anyone who is interested in security sector reconstruction uh, must know that ultimately it's uh, a work in progress it, it's not something that uh, is, 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 is permanent so I, I, I think that's an area that uh, I would like us to, to reflect on. The African Union has also become a lot more active, uh, particularly in uh, uh, playing some active roles in some of the conflicts that we've had to uh, deal with in the last uh, two, two decades. Uh, but one big factor that has impacted peace building in the last two decades is probably 9-11 more than any other thing. 
the uh, impact of the 9-11 uh, uh, act of terror has also uh, had positive and negative uh, impact on peace building, on regional action, on uh, the activities of uh, the, the, the nation states. But that has also, in a sense, reinforced the, 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 the statist approach to peace building away from the regional uh, a, a approach uh, during that, that period. Uh, because I would argue though that it's, it's been more of a setback for uh, uh, responsiveness for peace building uh, value addition in, in, in the continent of Africa because the new counter-terrorism agenda undermines all of the uh, factors that would have helped enhance uh, a peace building uh, uh, agenda including the democratization agenda itself uh, 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 on, on the continent. So, I, if we then look at the, the the key features of where we are now, it's clear that um, there is recognition that major changes are occurring uh, in the world to which established frameworks must adapt and our own experience on the continent of Africa uh, is that um, uh, excellent peace interventions provide some sense of these changes and respond to some of the emerging issues as well. Um, questions of demography, uh, particularly the place of the young uh, in, in, uh, on the continent, and the impact that idleness and unemployment has on the youth has also uh, exacerbated the uh, conflictual tendencies that we're dealing with uh, uh, on the continent. If we look at the statistics, as I'm sure you all know, over 60% fall into the category that we would define as youth. And whether you take the Boko Haram, or you take the Al Shabaab, or any of the conflicts uh, on the continent, you are clearly dealing with uh, a, a younger population that feels hard done by and uh, appears not to have anything to lose. And if we're going to deal with this, we would need to move from this liberal. Uh, approach to peace building to a developmental approach to uh, 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 peace building in, in my view. Uh, I, I think we're also witnessing a rise in asymmetrical uh, uh, conflicts uh, in, uh, 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 on the continent of, and it's of a peculiar extraction uh, groups that are waging uh, all manner of uh, warfare uh, against the state and seem to be uh, effectively uh, undermining the place of the state in the uh, 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 in, in the world uh, today. If you look at um, all the groups I've mentioned, Hakim, Al Shabaab, uh, Boko Haram. And Sahel Sharia, the the, the 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 dominant culture in in that uh, uh, in in those groups is clearly uh, the asymmetry uh, between the groups and the states that are being confronted, and the way they're able to really move uh, unrestrained. Uh, across territories, across countries, uh, in uh, pursuit of their of their agenda, uh, I, I think this transnational character of the asymmetrical conflict is also an issue that becomes uh, problematic for those involved in uh, peace building uh, work as well. Uh, I, I 
but I think it's beyond that. When I talk about the demography and the uh, uh, climate uh, change issues, you tend to see a lot more of these in the Sahel. Uh, most of the countries in the Sahel, the pressure on uh, the past release uh, because of the uh, harsh weather conditions clearly forced them into other uh, territories and that results in uh, relentless clashes uh, which again requires a multi-dimensional uh, 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 response uh, uh, to. So I, I, I do think um, we must also not understand the connection of these groups to the global terrorist uh, movement uh, 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 itself. But I don't think political Islam alone is the problem. I, I think it's fundamentalism uh, in all ways, including Christian fundamentalism uh, in, in many parts of, of the continent of, of, of Africa that we must uh, look at. But much more importantly, I think there's a question of how we manage diversity and difference as well within the countries in, in question. So I, 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 I don't see how we can address peace building as a holistic response to the conflict situation we have in Africa without taking on board uh, all of these issues. I, I do think from my own uh, knowledge of um, what's going on, I, I'm aware that um, there's now a current review of, of, of the peace building architecture uh, on the committee, the UN committee in which uh, Dr. Lonnie Shakin is now serving. Uh, I mean, I, I, and I know there have been other studies, uh, 1325 Women, uh, Peace and Security, and um, there are other reviews that have taken place. I do think if we're to make any headway, uh, it would be important to look at uh, the question of capacity, uh, the death of peacekeeping capacity itself uh, uh, on the continent. I, I do think we need to do more documentation uh, of the key milestones and trends uh, of, 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 of peace building. Uh, and I think the conception, as I said earlier, uh, needs to be uh, broadened to accommodate uh, maybe in a, uh, a holistic manner post-conflict and pre-conflict uh, issues, particularly early warning to conflict in those countries that are likely to unravel. Um, I mean, I, I expect people who are interested in peace building without sounding unnecessarily alarmist uh, to be very watchful of Nigeria now, uh, because of the implications, uh, a postponed election, uh, refusal to hold the election um, may have, and, and, and the implications that may then have uh, for peace and security, not just in Nigeria, but on the uh, West African coast and probably even the, the, the continent itself. So I, I do think that would be uh, uh, critical. Uh, the place of peace agreements too uh, would need to be uh, examined by players in the field. I mean, we've had peace agreements that have exacerbated tension and caused more conflict. And we've also had peace agreements uh, that have be more comprehensive and more nuanced in its understanding of the challenges of the state. But the tension would always be there, as we've seen in Sierra Leone, as we've seen in Liberia, as, as we've seen in other conflict uh, uh, or post-conflict settings. Tension between accountability on the one hand and reconciliation on the other, between truth and justice. Uh, and this is uh, a, a post building, uh, uh, a peace building conundrum in, in, in many, many states where we've um, come out of, of, of conflict. How do you manage uh, the situation in a manner that will not relapse 
back to conflict uh, and we will not ignore the uh, mindless orgy of violence that people have perpetrated against one another. Uh, so the tension between that uh, is one that we need to deal with. And then the question of sovereignty bound actors who are so statist in their thinking uh, it is one that uh, clearly has presented a challenge uh, to the peace building community. Uh, because on the one hand, you have issues that are transnational, as I say, but on the other hand, once you bring states into it, they use the cover of being a sovereign state to protect uh, or prevent what would otherwise have been uh, 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 more of a value addition to the search for peace, uh, uh, to block peace, ultimately. So I, I, I think we will need to look at, at, at this uh, and uh, see how best the peace building architecture uh, can take on board this. And in areas where it can't, then it should be acknowledged that it, it's not going to be done. Other actors would have to look at it. And I think local actors particularly, uh, because peace building occurs in a range of circumstances and places. It's not just when it becomes internationalized uh, that it is peace building. Uh, there are community activities that contribute more to peacemaking and, 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 and conflict uh, management than uh, even uh, uh, the international uh, actions that are usually uh, short term in orientation, usually donor driven and usually lacking in local ownership uh, of those who are ultimately going to be the uh, interveners and, and, and uh, promoters of, of, of this uh, post-conflict uh, environment. Um, and that, this is where for me leadership clearly plays a very central role, uh, selfless, committed, dedicated leadership. Uh, I would not make any bones about it and, uh, and uh, say that Boko Haram would not have grown uh, in the manner it has if the leadership in Nigeria has um, lived up to its responsibility and taken uh, it on in a multi-dimensional uh, manner. Yes, law and order uh, to restore peace uh, and stability, but ultimately uh, by being tough on the root causes of Boko Haram itself, because Boko Haram has not uh, generated the interest it generated simply because of some bandits. There are uh, others who have grown sympathetic to its cause and uh, clearly have been supportive of its action because they think the state has abandoned them. Uh, and uh, uh, there must be a way to address state failure in that regard uh, and ensure that citizens are looked after, opportunities are created, and uh, an ocean of misery is not allowed to fester in any uh, our country, which is clearly uh, what we are dealing with. Uh, another issue that I think we cannot ignore is the uh, the implication of states that have um, gone into crisis uh, and how this has also generated more conflict in other states. And here I'm looking at Libya, uh, the collapse of Libya or the the removal and death of, of Gaddafi opened the floodgate to armament. Uh, that has played a key role in the activities of many of those groups that I'm talking about in the Sahel uh, uh, region. Uh, and you also have new actors who play positive or negative roles because they've come into money. You have actors like uh, Chad, you have actors like Angola. Uh, if you look at what Angola is doing in the uh, Central African Republic, uh, uh, Chad in Mali and uh, a number of the countries there, 
we, we clearly need to look at uh, the role and accountability of those actors. That's at the local level within the continent. You also have new actors internationally, China in South Sudan and um, uh, Turkey, uh, uh, who are not the traditional players uh, on this scene before now, uh, but have grown uh, quite important in their engagement. And I wonder the extent to which that engagement actually uh, uh, falls within the UN peace building architecture uh, uh, at all. So um, I think in, in conclusion, uh, is the glass half full or half empty? I, 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 I honestly think um, we must not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Uh, if I were to take my own journey, um, a time there was that I couldn't leave this country as an exile, uh, and then uh, Nigeria still has many ills, but we can still challenge our government, we can still take uh, on uh, the state uh, if we don't believe it's uh, serving the interest of, of, of the uh, people, and we're doing that. And in many African states, at least 42 out of 48 African states over the last decade, uh, have held elections. Now, I'm not suggesting that elections in and of themselves make democracy, but it is a critical step in that journey. And it also helps to reduce the tension that might lead to conflict. Of course, elections do create conflict too. I mean, where they seem to be uh, less than free and fair. Of course, you all remember Kenya, um, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Comoros, Lesotho. There are countries where elections have generated conflict. Uh, but this is also why we would need to come back to looking at the best solution that fits individual states. Because Africa is not one country, uh, so it's difficult to overgeneralize about uh, these things uh, when you're talking about the continent. I do think, though, that uh, we're making progress. The progress is not fast enough, and we can do a lot more to begin to seriously address uh, the fundamental deficiencies we have uh, on the continent. Um, but I would... Uh, be happy to take questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Well, what we'll do is maybe take a call at the time and then Sumba. Leaders and the informal society. What is the role of the informal society in the entire conflict if the leaders are not chipping in their bit? Do you want me to take a couple? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Do um, you find elections too expensive for societies that are not cohesive enough? For example, what is the point of going into elections in Nigeria when northeastern uh, North Nigeria is actually um, having lots of conflicts there uh, brought about by Boko Haram? Secondly, um, could you share with us some of your leadership challenges? when you are the governor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll I thought I was in here to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, precisely because that's, that's, that's my first question, sir. You, you have a background in, um, you know, in security studies and you went on to become a governor uh, and you lost election. And one of the reasons that was headed around by the masses is that while you were building infrastructure, you forgot the infrastructure of the stomach, which is their concern for survival. So did you misread the security concern of the people and focus on infrastructure rather than uh, economic building? Then the second question is, I want you to just give me your thoughts about why do you think the Nigeria's military were un unable to take on both Haram on their own? Thank you. I think we'll leave those last set uh, for you to answer. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. What's been the role of the informal sector in the Boko Haram crisis? Actually, I think the informal sector has been quite active uh, in the resistance to Boko Haram. Uh, you would have heard of the group called Civilian JTF. And what the Civilian JTF does is actually offer an anchor uh, to the military in first identifying, uh, providing intelligence to them, and also assisting in going after uh, those um, uh, uh, insurgents. And in many cases, they've proven to be more effective than the uh, formal military structures since this is an asymmetrical uh, engagement. Many of the people that the official military is confronting, they don't even know them and they live within some of the communities. Uh, it's a classic uh, guerrilla uh, uh, insurgency operation, and you're always going to be at a disadvantage. Information and intelligence is the one thing that can put you at an advantage under those circumstances. And I think the uh, civilian leaders, the ulamas, uh, have been quite um, effective in, in dealing with that, but I think the problem has become a lot deeper over the years due to neglect. And also, if you look at the provenance of Boko Haram in Nigeria, it, it was not unconnected to political uh, partisanship. Uh, and once they grew from being Ekomog forces to Taliban to Boko Haram, uh, without any effective uh, 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 determination to put a stop to it, it was easy to proliferate. In the northern part of Nigeria, particularly in the northeast, I mean, you have over 10 million children who are out of school. And this is a Molotov cocktail. They alone, uh, uh, they have nothing doing. And I mean, I have recently been campaigning all over the north, and the crowd that we see at campaign grounds in, I mean, we went to Medjugorje uh, about two weeks ago. It was unbelievable. So, and that for me is also uh, a concern because the reason why they're coming is that they believe that we're going to make their lives better. So there's a crisis of expectation that comes with uh, uh, these elections in that regard, since they've lost any hope or interest in what the current uh, government is doing. But the informal society is working. Uh, I think the government needs to do a lot more to reinforce what they're doing uh, uh, through the traditional uh, mechanisms uh, uh, and the the the, the, um, the the institutions of states also need to protect them so that they don't fall. Many of them are falling victims once they're discovered to be giving information to the state about the uh, terrorists. Then it becomes a problem for you. But 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 they are doing something. But these are the kind of things that need to be documented, as I was uh, talking about earlier. Elections too expensive, and uh, should there be a focus on election on the northeast uh, of Nigeria? Well, I don't know about <laughs> elections being expensive. I think election is more of a commitment. Uh, once you make the commitment, you can always find a way to make election possible without breaking the bank. And if elections could take place in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, I mean, Nigeria is one of the... And in Nigeria that you're talking about, you're talking about only 14 local governments out of 774 local governments. So why not have the election in the 760 local governments and go back to the 14 local government, provide adequate security, it, because the people are yearning for change. They want it. It's not about anyone imposing it on them. Uh, but that's not to say that election is the only tool.
for renewing society or that a majoritarian democracy is the only solution. I, for one thing, we need to start looking at, I mean, other options uh, or additional options because if you have an election in which somebody has 48% of the vote and you have 52% of the vote, and you say that all the 48% should go to hell uh, because the 52% uh, uh, person has won a simple majority. There has to be a mechanism to let all take ownership of the process. Uh, how we get there, I don't know. In some states, they do proportional representation uh, and ensure that it's a percentage of the vote that will determine uh, your presence in parliament uh, or in any other governmental uh, 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 office. So I do think we need to be more creative about the approach, but elections themselves are not the problem, uh, in my view. Um, what are my leadership challenges in office? Uh, I, I think this myth has been broken. Uh, I don't know how I, I don't know one if you are in Nigeria. Are you a Nigerian? Yes. Okay, if you're a Nigerian, then you would have heard about some tapes recently. So you would know that I did not lose an election to neglecting stomach infrastructure, what did you call it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, <coughs> I lost to Mr. Jonathan, who was desperate and determined to prove that he could have an inroad into the Southwest in anticipation of 2015. That's what happened in my election, and the, the story is coming out uh, now to Nigerians. Uh, but that's not to say that there weren't challenges. Um, don't forget, uh, <laughs> I was an unusual governor. Uh, I, I'm also an unusual politician in the sense that I'm not a machine politician. Politics is not my, my day job. Uh, but I went into politics from being an activist, running an opposition radio, uh, being involved in anti-military activities whilst out here in this country. And that's the trajectory. And when I got into Nigeria in um, 99, I didn't go into politics. It wasn't a conscious ambition that I must go and do this. I was invited to come and run. And that's why I said I, I thought it was foolish that I actually uh, accepted that invitation. Uh, but. I have no reason to regret it because I did not just uh, focus on fiscal infrastructure. I actually introduced some of the most uh, enduring stomach infrastructure in Nigerian <laughs> politics. Uh, and, and, and that's a fact. Uh, I, 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 I'm making light of it, but it's, it's a fact. My government was the first government ever in Nigeria that introduced social security benefit scheme to the elderly and pays a stipend, a cash transfer to old people in Nigeria who are extremely indigent. That has now become a policy. If you check the manifesto of the APC, my party now, we've incorporated that in it. Uh, because you cannot enhance social capital if you run a country in which 1% of the living unimaginably obscene prosperity and the bulk of the citizenry are in this vast ocean of misery, it's a peace building no no. And that's what we have in Nigeria. Uh, so for me, it was important that we really did something about the extremely poor uh, uh, and give them a sense of belonging in the country. And that's what I did uh, for youth leaving school, uh, for the elderly, uh, for children. And if you look at the statistics, 
my state is one of the smallest states uh, but don't be confused by that as I always say even though it's one of the smallest it's certainly uh, bigger in population size than 15 African countries uh, so if you're talking of Gambia and Guinea-Bissau and uh, Guinea and Mauritius and uh, Botswana it is bigger than any of those countries so but in four years uh, in office, when you look at the statistics when I left, the highest life expectancy in Nigeria is in Ikita. The lowest mortality rate, child mortality, maternal mortality is Ikiti. Ikiti is the state with the lowest HIV prevalence in Nigeria. And it has the highest number of kids in schools, 90%. So on all those counts, <laughs> those are not, uh, yes, I built roads and uh, schools but I also did other things. If you're talking about human development index, you, you have the figures there to show for it. But I also offended many people. I asked teachers to do exams before they can teach because our teachers were failing these children in, in my state. It used to be the intellectual capital of Nigeria the state that has produced most of the professors and every uh, other uh, stellar performance. But things have gone completely pear-shaped. And when I became governor, I decided that no, I grew up in this state. I went to school here. I went to public school. So if I could be produced by these uh, 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 institutions, there's no reason why we should be failing. And I introduced a number of measures that were not palatable to uh, teachers. And teachers, they are a strong constituency in my state. And uh, I believe um, they felt, no, we don't want to take uh, uh, exams every year uh, <laughs> in order to prove that we are up to the task. And the civil servants, too, <coughs> I eliminated ghost workers, saved the state uh, about six million dollars uh, weekly every year uh, from introducing a biometric payroll uh, system and those who were beneficiaries of the money that I saved they weren't happy so it's uh, but for me politics is about service politics is not business uh, I'm here I'm still alive <laughs> Nigerian military and Boko Haram why has it been difficult for the Nigerian military too? honestly motivation um, leadership and um, lack of interest on the part of, of, of the uh, of the political leadership I would say I mean uh, Let's face it, this is the same Nigeria. This is Nigeria in, in Congo in the 60s, Nigeria in Sierra Leone and Liberia, Nigeria in Darfur. It's the same Nigeria that has earned laurels for its involvement in peacekeeping activities around the world. So I don't want to accept that the Nigerian military is so professionally incompetent as to not be in a position to take out this ragtag uh, force. But if you die on the war front, if you're sent to a war front without arms and ammunition, you're going to have to think twice. And when you listen to the interviews of many of the uh, soldiers on the war front in Boko Haram. It's a sorry tale. Uh, even though the money has been earmarked for it, but it has not been earmarked. <laughs> 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 you 
you will not see the impact of the billions of dollars that had been uh, allocated to the defense ministry. Maybe, and, and we, we, we must also be careful not to treat the military as a monolith. The military as an institution is often very different from uh, its service chiefs that have gone into bed with the political leadership in the country and have totally forgotten about their own world. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem. And as a student of the Nigerian military myself, uh, I know that they are not happy about the way this government has uh, handled military matters. And, and clearly, uh, security sector governance would have to be a major priority for, uh, for our party, if we're lucky, if we win that election. You know that um, within the next six months, no territory of Nigeria would be under the control of uh, any insurgents. Thank you. Hola. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we'll take a few. Injustice. You have this 1% greedy and the 99% with grievances. And uh, those people in North Nigeria who rebel do this for feeling. Uh, unjustly treated or their concerns were not looked at properly and when they rebel. So it's injustice which is the problem and what we, ha what we have to address. So maybe the, it's a good idea to pave the way to the brain uh, by using the right terms and speak of justice building. Well, this would make peace building from a technical task to a political one. And I think this would be a, I think we should maybe get the habit to use justice building. Uh, I, I don't disagree with, uh, oh, OK, you want to say um, Yeah, uh, Richard Dowden. Um, I come from a country where the, the political certainties were very clear for certainly all of my life and suddenly they've all begun to melt and it's very difficult to see what's going to emerge from our election um, with the possibility of a, a party that wants, the, the, wants to leave Europe even combining with a country that wants to stay. I mean it really is, I've never known an election like this, nobody knows what's going to happen. What what are the? This is a really difficult question. But what are the issues for ordinary Nigerians? I mean, are they what are they talking about when they say election? Are they saying what can this man give us now to cast the vote for him, or do they do they listen to the promises that are made and make? And what are what are the issues? And they may be different in different places. I know it's a difficult question, but I mean, when they discuss it, what are they what do they want other than this leader or that leader, what are the issues for them? My question goes to um, what you've said about the kind of uh, projects that you put up and um, of course you never, um, there was a backlash, what I would say a backlash from the civil servants and the teachers and that kind of thing. Do we take that as a lesson that if you aspire to do this kind of positive kind of leadership, then you'll have a short lifespan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then you should just go in knowing that you'll have a very short lifespan so you don't have to be ambitious uh, in that sense because ideally if you're not using militia uh, or party tags and all these kind of means of enrichment, then you'll have an extended life. And then does failure in assigned leadership mean that there's failure in the leadership of the entire society? So if the government of Nigeria present could not be able to handle the Boko Haram crisis, what about the informal leaders, the imams, the sheikhs, who can also influence or share uh, uh, that kind of, uh, extend their influence over, for example, the Boko Haram if it is an issue of political Islam? So does this informal leadership also collapse when the assigned leadership collapses? Thank you. Maybe I should leave that. I have my next two here, and I'm going to start with you next. Okay, so maybe we should let. Uh, oh, okay. The few questions. Yes. 
is uh, peace building, justice building. Yes, I, I, I talked about the entire continuum and that it's important not to just treat peace building as uh, disaster and relief, DDR in the immediate aftermath of conflict to stretching it to um, justice, reconciliation, accountability, economic development, uh, ultimately. Uh, and um, But in doing that, I think what is often not taken into consideration, and, and maybe this goes to the question that um, the gentleman asked me about my state, I think sequencing is a key uh, factor in this. Uh, one must be mindful of the, the, the resistance that's likely to come. Uh, for example, uh, justice building in a country like um, Sierra Leone in the aftermath of the Lome Peace Accord created crisis. And in Liberia, after the Accra Peace Accord, even though Accra Peace Accord tried to accommodate um, the creation of a Truth and Justice uh, Commission, but on the ground, some of the perpetrators of the, the, the problems were part of the government of Judy Bryant uh, during the signing of that uh, 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 accord. And that's why timing, sequencing becomes uh, uh, critical to the justice-seeking uh, constituency as well. And, and we also have to be very, very careful about this, this terminologies. Uh, I think ultimately, peace building is a political project. It's not a technical project. People who have reduced it to the technical dimension are those who don't want to get involved in the politics of it. And you can't resolve these multifaceted, multidimensional problems if you don't get involved in the, in the politics of it. But I do agree with you that justice building is a very critical component uh, uh, of it. Um, what are the ordinary Nigerians thinking uh, about this election? Well, I won't give you my view. One of the things we did as a party was to commission uh, a survey in the 36 states of the country uh, in preparation for our manifesto. We went around, hired professionals to talk to ordinary Nigerians. What are the issues for them? Number one, jobs. It was jobs, jobs, jobs. Unemployment is huge. 60% of young school leavers don't have anything doing. Officially, 23.9% of the population, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, is unemployed. So, if you have a 24% unemployment, uh, people clearly are going to be worried. And you ask yourself, if there is this much idleness in society, how come this country has not totally collapsed? Uh, that's also the uh, uh, area to look at the informal sector that, that he, he talked about. But jobs is number one. Uh, security is number two. And corruption is number three. I mean, there are other things. People are worried about education, they're worried about health care, but in the survey. And it's so interesting that in our campaign, these are issues that resonate across the length and breadth of the country. Um, everywhere we go, people talk to us about jobs. Uh, security more so in particular places than others, but security is still big. And then the economy in relation to corruption is uh, uh, a big issue for, for Nigerians. And on those three issues, they don't think the government has the, the current incumbent has done uh, well uh, to deserve uh, being re-elected. Should we take um, certain activities as a recipe for backlash or for short lifespan in office? 
Well, I don't know what you mean by a short lifespan. I signed up for a four-year term, uh, and I served my four-year term. Uh, it's true that um, I signed up uh, to contest for another four-year term. I do not believe that the backlash, so-called, uh, was responsible for what happened in Ekiti, as I said earlier. It has nothing to do with it. I think most most ordinary folks are genuine. Yes, they're worried about the immediate. What's going to happen to me? Where am I going to get my next meal from? But at least in Ekiti, because the literacy level is a little higher than normal. People are also worried about substantive development. Uh, uh, and I think um, I will return to that point about sequencing. There are things I probably should have done differently uh, in terms of uh, implementing those hard um, programs that I knew it's constituencies that are influential may not particularly uh, like. But for me, I, I just felt that these were things that had to be done. Uh, it's, it's not a surprise that uh, after my results was announced, my colleague in Edo State quickly removed the test for teachers and said he's no longer doing tests <laughs> <laughs> for teachers. If they want to remain illiterate and produce illiterate children, uh, that's their problem, not his. <laughs> but <coughs> really, we must see governance beyond office holding. We must see politics uh, beyond the next election. What is it that we're in public life for? Is it just to win elections or to make a fundamental difference in the lives of the people? If, if it's about a fundamental difference, you, you shouldn't have to apologize uh, for doing the right thing you may maybe learn how to do it in a manner that is less obtrusive uh, <laughs> to the citizenry, but the right thing is the right thing. I mean, even if we win this election nationally, I mean, the, the reality that we've seen studying all the papers as somebody working on policy for the APC now is that we may end up with an empty treasury. And if we end up with an empty treasury, we're not going to be able to provide Nigerians with uh, low-hanging fruit immediately after the election. We're going to have to confront the reality that, look, these things are not likely to produce the expected, uh, the exaggerated expectations that people have. Yet, that is also what I think politics is about. It's about truth-telling. But truth can be bitter in politics. Uh, I that's the point uh, you, you're making. And does failure of leadership at the uh, central level or national level also mean failure of leadership at the informal level? I, I don't think so. But if you have a society that has become artificial, in which those that you call informal leaders are also tied to the apron strings, of the former leaders, then you have a problem. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Nigeria has moved from the realm of spirituality to religiosity. And every, every street corner that you get to, there is a church. Believe it or not, these churches have been suborned, and uh, most uh, religious leaders, I dime a dozen, they are all trundling to go to Asoro to collect their own share of the cake and to come and campaign for the incumbent. That's what we see on the ground. And these are the informal leaders of society. The traditional rulers are collecting their own too. I mean, the president spent the whole of last week in my part of the country, and all he was doing was sharing money to traditional rulers, to religious leaders, the informal leaders you're talking about. So if you're so tied to the status quo in that manner, how are you going to be able to speak truth to power? That, that, that's 
I would like to know <laughs> how that would happen. Thank you. Uh, next, please. One, two, three. Yes, three. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm putting this. My name is Kevin. So I am not a student of this school, I'm a student of SOAS, a PhD student uh, looking at single currency in West Africa. Um, I heard of the information about this lecture, on, I saw it on internet, so I said I just have to be here. And honestly, I want to ask a question, but before that, I just want to commend you for your leadership quality in Nikiti and the peace you experienced there, because I was there during the election, I went, I went, I went the, during the tribunal thing. So uh, I was lecturing in federal police as well. So I really want to commend you. And you say you offended some people, the teachers and the local government people. Uh, no, you have not offended them. You have done the right thing. Because I was one of those who will support you, who do everything on Facebook uh, against the, the man who eventually won in court. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they were threatening me that I should not even come to the now, that uh, there will be problems if I come. So you really done well. So that's. Um, Commendation to you. My question is that there is um, a mini terrorism in the kitchen now, mm -hmm. which is giving us problems. Yeah. But that's one of the things I just mentioned. I've received information <coughs> that I should not even come home because I was about to go two weeks ago. They are fresh here and there that if I come home, they are going to deal with me. But I used to live in a kitchen. But don't you think if this terrorism is not curtailed, and I do not wish your party to lose, but if your party, even, eventually, if your party didn't win, don't you think this? Um, Mini terrorism in Nigeria can have effect on Southwest and eventually all over Nigeria, and our, our, our peace will be murdered. So, mm. that's my good question. question. Thank you, Shiva. Um, okay, I'll stand so that we can be here a bit later. I want to to follow on this 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 trail of of the justice issue, um, and to say, I mean, as as you as you are cautioning that you know the timing, the sequencing, the sequencing, etc., is important. But within the break, the broader peace building discourse, uh, what is the place of the discussions around justice and accountability? Um, we've seen, um, and I'm coming from civil society, so we've seen uh, that the, our African leaders do not have an appetite for, for these discussions around accountability especially. And for you as a politician, but also someone who has been an activist, what would you say is the way to re- um, reword or re I don't know repackage this discussion around accountability around the need to address impunity so that it is palatable in a way to to to, to our leaders because um, on the ground the people will continue to talk about to talk about the desire for justice to talk about the desire for wrongs to be righted but the discussion has almost been hijacked by those who will um, promote the ICC for example but that's not necessarily what what people are saying, but they are demanding justice. So that's my, that's the first part. The second part is um, going deeper again. You, you talked about you know peace agreements that that will either nuance these discussions or peace agreements that could uh, um, uh, prevent uh, the, you know um, that could lead back to crisis or to war. Um, in the case in particular of South Sudan and the African Union Peace and Security Council decided to defer the report of the Commission of Inquiry. Um, yeah, as a, again, as a politician, what would some of the strategies be to, to make use of that exercise um, that would not necessarily uh, jeopardize, jeopardize the peace? That's not about you, yeah. thank you. So my, uh, my name is Marco Pellegrin. And um, uh, just to start, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, I'm in the science and engineering world, but Again, I just wanted to come in and listen to uh, Dr. Faiyemi uh, talking about uh, this subject matter. So I'm actually enjoying this. And um, so before I ask my question, I also want to just add, given the topic we're discussing, I think, I think Dr. Faiyemi has, has been a bit modest about his uh, achievement in Akiti. And I think one example was immediately after the election, despite the intimidation and arm twisting, Dr. Faiyemi immediately accepted the result and extended a hand of uh, 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 friendship to uh, uh, Mr. Kwaweshi. That in itself actually does tension immediately. So it's an act that you did, which was, you know, when you talk about peace building, that was a very clear example. I know you've not talked about it, but I think I, I would like to commend you on that because I felt that really helped 
you know, stabilize the uh, equity after the, immediately after the election. So my question is, uh, given that, you know, the way I think as an engineer is that I try to understand the root cause of a problem to find a solution to it. So I need to understand the root cause. So what would you say are the root, co well, maybe one or two root cause to the conflict we have in Africa? Is there a common theme around the conflicts that we seem to have in Africa that, you know, that then requires what you call peace building? So can we avoid the problem in the first place? And if you think, so what do you think is that root cause, if there's one or two? Thank you. I, I think we'll still have time for one more round of questions. But can I get an indication of who else wants to say something? Okay, I, I think we're fine. If you answer this, uh, three, then we'll take the very Okay. Um, military terrorism. Uh, Mr. Mogadi, thank you so much for highlighting this. At the risk of sounding modest, we're not going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with that. And it's in the overall interest of Nigerians that we don't lose this election. Because if we do, the implications are dire uh, for the country. Um, but the example of fire shade uh, is in itself one reason why you must always ensure that people don't get into public office via brigandage and criminality. Because if they do, impunity would become the order of the day. And and that's why he's behaving the way he's behaving. But I can tell you, you know, he was behaving this way. When I challenged him in 2006, and a lot of the people were coward, that period you were still at the Polytechnic, uh, I was receiving, averagely in a week, uh, two assassination threats from him and his crowd. I mean, the New York Times did a, a beautiful story on this when I ran in 2006, 2007. So when you know him, you know the logic of a bully. The logic of a bully is to continue to intimidate on, until someone stands up to the bully. And I think that's what Nigerians have to do uh, in order to stem the tide of this mini terrorism escalating into a conflagration, as you described it. Uh, and the way to do it is to use uh, our right as citizens, use the vote <laughs> to, to, to do the right thing. But in the event that such a thing happens, though, it's a continuing struggle. <laughs> we'll keep at it until we ensure that the country uh, follows the right path. Uh, that, that's my own uh, uh, attitude to it. Shuai, you are absolutely right. <laughs> what is the pace of discussion uh, around peace and accountability? What should be the pace of discussion uh, in the immediate aftermath of the conflict? Uh, until you secure the peace and ultimately uh, get development. Again, that I must say is a technical approach <laughs> to it. It is because there is no, I don't think there is a one size fits all uh, pace that you must follow uh, in, in order to do this. And, I, and I'll share a personal experience. I. In, in the immediate aftermath of military rule in Nigeria in 1999, I was responsible uh, for the um, research and advisory work around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Nigeria, known as the Oputa Panel. That, that was the, one of the really first jobs I did when I returned to Nigeria to advise the government on how to go about it to bring people like Archbishop Tutu and Co to Nigeria to work with our the late Justice Oputa, uh, who chaired the panel with Bishop Cook and now Bishop Cook and a couple of uh, our distinguished people. And I remember at the time, every time I went into a meeting with uh, President of Asanjo at the time, with um, 
uh, Justice Okuta, the first thing he will say to Justice Okuta is that, do you know this man well? And when he just said, oh, he's the one who has been assisting us, he's a good man, he said, no, 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 I don't mean it that way. Do you know him very well? <laughs> and the man would look very confused, and Obasanjo would say, you know, I know Karate more than you do. He wants revenge. I want reconciliation. <laughs> <laughs> and here was the person the report was going to be submitted to <laughs> at the end of the exercise. And he had already defined even before. <laughs> and, and I think in his position, it was the right thing to do because he didn't want to open old wounds. And I mean, he himself was in jail, so he had a grouse. But he, he was able to overcome that. And I think that's why, for me, individual search for justice may always be problematic. And yet, you can't stop people from individually feeling pain that, look, I've been put through this, or my family member has been put through this. But if we can find a mechanism for community reparation, uh, I, I think that would be the way to go as long as there's accountability. The nature of the accountability, we may debate, but there must be accountability. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if it is community-based, uh, much more institutional, and drawing on lessons uh, from those kinds of um, egregious violation of rights, uh, I, I think one would have uh, achieve the report. And that's why for me, I, I think what happened in the South Sudanese uh, case is actually very, very logical and positive because the release of the re re report might have even escalated things uh, for that because things were still uh, a bit tenuous. Uh, uh, it was a suspended uh, uh, peace, if, if, if you like. Uh, uh, so that, that's my view on that. Thank you for your commendation of my concession speech. It wasn't really a concession speech. Uh, I should <laughs> explain. Uh, I, I had information. Everything that is now coming out now, I knew. I had the information on what they wanted to do to the ordinary people if I had called them out on a resistance uh, to what transpired. And I felt, why do I want the blood of ordinary people on my hands? Uh, why not secure the peace now and seek justice later? So it's more to do with sequencing again than uh, uh, because we suddenly have not given up. And when the captain decided to come out, uh, he, he didn't do it because we propped him to do it. Because he's a good Nigerian who was very unhappy at what transpired uh, on the scene. And he was there. He was the intelligence officer responsible for the entire election. Um, so I, I just felt it was a, a way of dousing the tension. Yes, you're right. It was, it was a way of dousing the tension. But much more importantly, it was a way of even avoiding uh, people dying, uh, which would have happened. They were that determined to kill uh, innocent people on account of any protest that might have arisen. What do I think? We could certainly have a whole seminar on the root causes of conflict in Africa. <laughs> and um, there will be no agreement. I, 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 I just think um, somebody said it's 90% grievance, 10% greed. Uh, I don't want to back. But I, I do think if one wants to look at it in a much broader perspective, uh, I, uh, my own sense is that it's incomplete nation building processes. That's how I would put it. We're still struggling to find form and content uh, in our nation building project. Uh, and along that line, it, it's a continuum. You have progress. You have reversal. If you look at Africa now, if you look at even the typology of democratization, I mean, you, we have suddenly 
uh, to use the term that has been used there, I don't know, I don't think there's any consolidated democracy, but there are consolidating democracies on the continent now. Uh, and there are also countries that are in relapse. But how do you define relapse? That was the first point I made about Burkina Faso, because I'm in a certain level of confusion. If the people, after years of oppression, decide to revolt, how do we define that? I, 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 I have some difficulty uh, on that now. Is that unconstitutional change of government by African Union's definition? Or is it only coup d'etats that are on constitutional change of government? I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's a puzzle that I would like academics to help resolve, <laughs> because suddenly Burkina Bays were not <laughs> unhappy that what happened happened. Mm -hmm. But then, mob psychology also promotes <laughs> that kind of happiness. Uh, it's it's a tricky one. Is that a model to look out for? Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Burkina Faso. And look at how we've ended up in Egypt and Tunisia. And um, <laughs> uh, all these countries. I, I, I think it's worth reflecting on, really. Great. Thank you. This is definitely the last round of questions. It's a very busy period at Cape, so there will be another class waiting there at six. Uh, before I take this next round of questions, let me seize the opportunity to invite everyone just down the corridor uh, to the staff common room where we have uh, drinks uh, waiting uh, so that you can continue your conversation for a short period uh, with the former governor. For the last round of questions, and then three. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I have to declare my father is from the Kitty State, so but I consider myself a Nigerian Creole. But um, but I wanted to ask a question about um, national identity. In some quarters, your presidential candidate uh, Buhari is feared because there's a certain fear that he's going to impose a kind of northern hegemony on Nigeria. Um, and Nigeria is a country that's a hundred years old, but there's still no. Well, some might argue there's no national identity. So I wanted you to talk about what you think the proper role of a national leadership is in creating that national identity, particularly in reference to things like federal character and the indigent, non-indigent laws. Yeah, my question is a bit related to that. You mentioned um, this clash of fundamentalisms as a major driver of conflict these days. And I guess if you look at the map of Africa, you can see a sort of conveyor belt coming across the Red Sea, through Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, even South Sudan, but uh, Central African Republic, uh, then the Sahel, and sadly Nigeria. And one of the, I've just come back from Nigeria, and one of the impressions I got, and well, statements by politicians on both sides of the divide is, religion has entered Nigeria's politics in a big way, in a way we've never seen it before, where you even in the South, where you had a kind of model coexistence of Islam and Christianity, uh, that's gone. And you see that in Mali, it's in a different way. The, the Wahhabites are now domi dominating the Muslim uh, Islamic Council in, in Mali, having been paid off by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And so these new elements are, are changing the face of, of, of politics and inserting a clash of fundamentalisms, and of course the American uh, right, religious right are funding their own side in this. How do you think can this be reversed? I mean, you know, secularism for all doesn't sound at the moment a very convincing election slogan, and no one seems to be really making that case, except extremely repressive outfits like Sisi, and he's not really a secularist, but he's certainly repressive. So I'm, won I'm wondering what you think is the way to sort of douse this down and whether it can be doused down. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of my moderator to ask uh, the last uh, question or two. And of course, one of them we can discuss you know, much further uh, when we get to, to the drinks. I, I actually am among those who believe that uh, 
the notion of stomach infrastructure is alive and well in AKT, but not from the ordinary AKT people who actually, uh, many of them loved your government because of the very you know, points that you were making. Social security, those people who would have voted you know, you into a second term. But from a small core of middle class AKT people who had entrenched interests and actually were very aggrieved that uh, you were not sharing money enough, you were building all these uh, structures, you were creating all these things, and there was very little money in their pocket. And it didn't matter how much they themselves ate in that, you know, uh, through the back uh, roots. So I, I, still, I still think that despite all that uh, rigging and assault on, you know, uh, on your people during the elections that the condition of stomach in infrastructure is one. As somebody was saying, unfortunately, that it introduced it to, uh, to the lexicon, you know, uh, political science. Uh, the second <laughs> issue, though, uh, is that I'm not, you know, some of us are not very optimistic that, in fact, elections will hold on the 28th of March. Uh, there are dynamics, uh, even at this moment, that suggest that everything possible will be done to ensure that those elections will not hold because for the first time there's some kind of competition that is evident. It's no longer competition. I think the, the tide uh, and the, the way Nigerians are responding to the issues you just talked about, unemployment, security, and corruption, or the state of the economy, is such that they want a change. And so everything will be done to take us, you know, take this beyond March 28th and just run us into a constitutional crisis. I don't know what you have to say to that. All of those three questions in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. National identity. Um, what's the role of a leader? Well, I, I, I think I, certainly it's the duty of a leader to um, drive an identity that is not um, sectarian or sectional uh, in any way. But I think it's even more the role for the constitution of the country. I, I think there's a way in which the Nigerian constitution even promotes this uh, divided loyalty to the state. Because if you have a constitution that says uh, you are an indigent, of a particular section of the country and I cannot enjoy the privileges that you have in that section because I wasn't born there although I've lived there for God knows how long I pay my taxes there my children go to school there yet I am not entitled to the benefits that you have. So it's uh, something that clearly causes uh, those who fall victim of such discrimination to ask themselves questions about this settler indigenous uh, policy. Yet you, 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 and that's why I, I made the point I made about a nation building process. I mean, he, he, that is mostly responsible for the conflict that we have on the continent. I think we are going to have to get to a point in which residence becomes your qualification for whatever entitlement you have, not uh, nativity or indigenship or any of those terminologies that are very rife in Nigeria. You also have a duty, indeed, a responsibility as a leader not to surround yourself with only people that look like you, uh, which is a problem in Nigeria. Yadra was president and all his key advisors are from Katsina. Uh, if you look at the gentleman who is there now, you see the uh, people around him that are his closest allies, uh, the people from uh, is a section of the country and it believes maybe and that's something in Africa uh, we all feel that if you are not from my neck of the wood you can't protect me so you want to make your chief of army staff be like you 
your security and intelligence chief from your side of the country. Your this, I, I, I think the, 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 the leaders that we've had have contributed a great deal to, to that uh, problem as well. But I, I think citizens themselves need to be in a position to define what happened by the effectiveness of, of, of governance, not by where somebody comes from. And it's still part of our problem. Uh, there are people who will vote for Jonathan come rain or shine, even if they don't have a job in the next 50 years. <laughs> because he's my brother. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. <laughs> and even if they're going to get the, the lifeline from Buhari, they will never vote for him. So I, I, I think it's uh, something we need to work on uh, a lot more. But leadership would have to play a critical role. All these things about federal character and co, they've not really worked. I am one of, I'm a Nigerian who has a view that you have competent people from all parts of Nigeria. There's no part of Nigeria you can get to where you don't find people who are competent to occupy positions. But what federal character does is to reinforce mediocrity and then undermines that fellow feeling that ought to have promoted uh, 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 national cohesion and national identity in the manner that uh, you, you are espousing. So I, I, I think things like that should go from our constitution. I think the business of asking you your state of origin and uh, where you come from should not feature in any documentation of a Nigerian. Uh, and uh, I, I think every Nigerian citizen should be protected wherever they find themselves, uh, not have to run away from a particular place because it's not their native uh, uh, place. So, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, uh, an issue we have to keep working on in the nation building project. You know what they say, Patrick, about patriotism being the... <laughs> <laughs> refuge. <laughs> oh, scoundrel. I think religion has mm -hmm. become the refuge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. As uh, well as the opium. <laughs> <laughs> as well as the opium uh, in, 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 in Nigeria. And I don't even think it's so much religion. I think it's, it's just the notion that I am religious, not what I feel privately. Because religion really should be a private thing, mm -hmm. uh, personal to you. And I think the way to do it, if I'm asked, it should be taken out of anything to do with uh, governance and uh, the constitution. Mm -hmm. Religion should not feature in the constitution of Nigeria at all. Uh, Nigerian space, at least the governmental space, should be a place where the religious and the non-religious should find Pace to engage in the overall interest of the people. But what has happened? I think this 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 current government has done more damage, in my view, uh, by using religion as a vehicle for manipulating Nigerians. Oh, the reason why they don't like me is because I'm I'm not from the north. I'm not a Muslim. So you, my brothers, who are Christians, is this how you're going to be looking at them, destroy me? <laughs> Nothing to do with your performance in office. Who cares what religion you espouse? But increasingly, poverty and fatalism seem to go together. So if you're poor, Somebody tells you in your church that your millions will soon arrive. But keep at it. So the little that you have, you give it to the pastor or the imam. Nigerian pastors probably parade the largest number of private jets around the world. Mm. And yet their own congregation 
So in Nigeria, I know that somebody builds a university, a religious uh, leader builds a university. Those who attend this church, they can't even afford the fees for their own children to go to the university. And this is commonplace. So I, 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 if we don't do something about it, religion will kill the country. This contestation between fundamentalisms of the Christian right and the uh, Muslim uh, uh, radicals, it's going to turn the country to shreds. And we need to quickly address it. I believe the way to address it is for the government of Nigeria to serve the people of Nigeria and not use religion as an excuse. I mean, uh, General Buhari was with Catholic bishops, I think it was two weeks ago. He had to go and speak to Catholic bishops and was given an example that, look, people talk about me and religion. Yes, I'm a man of faith, but for me, it's a private thing. I was not the one who took Nigeria to OIC, and I was certainly not the first Nigerian president to go to OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries. Jonathan, interestingly, was the first Nigerian president to go to OIC conference. And when I had the opportunity to be president of Nigeria, head of state in Nigeria, 70% of my cabinet was Christian. 11 out of the 19 governors that I appointed were Christians. He gave them these statistics and said, let someone come out and challenge it. Mm. And so when they say these things, that it can't be defended, and that for him, religion is a personal thing. It should not be brought to uh, the public space for manipulation. And I think that is really the solution to that. Uh, issue that that raised. For me, you are right. I had issues with the tiny middle class, but you know the middle class have a way of also spreading their influence around. And in the Ekiti ex example, uh, in the Ekiti experience, definitely uh, those who lost out, who felt that um, the money was not being shared, uh, had their, uh, uh, they, they had their, 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 their issue with me, but I, I, I don't think that in terms of its influence, I, I don't think it, it would have had that level of impact uh, if what transpired in equity had not transpired. I, uh, but I do, I take the point you're making. Will elections hold? Well, I wish I <coughs> were clairvoyant and uh, able to tell you that election will not hold. Uh, but you know, the thing with Nigeria is that many of these leaders are not good students of history. If they're good students of history, they won't even toy with. Because Nigeria is one country where you will never win against the people. It may take time, but the people will triumph. Somebody tried a third term agenda, distributed millions of naira all over the place. And when it came to crunch, he lost out. Yes, he was able to now insert uh, a fourth 11 team in the country that has gotten us to the point that we're in now, but at least he personally did not succeed with his agenda. Somebody also tried to uh, subvert the 93 election. He also lost out. Yes, Jonathan could create a constitutional crisis. He actually is in a position, uh, he's the one who could do it. If anyone could do it, he's the one who could do it, but he's the one who could also step away from it. Uh, and I think it's, it's a peace-building moment, actually. Uh, and I can say that one of the things going on is back channels discussion. If they have fears of the unknown, uh, maybe they need to be reassured that there will be no witch hunt 
but that will not necessarily stop accountability uh, in the manner that Shivai wants it to happen. <laughs> because the country needs accountability for what has transpired. And, and Jarabwari said this morning at Chatham House that um, he's not out on a witch hunting uh, project. Uh, he's not interested in uh, uh, settling old scores. But it would not also stop the judiciary from doing its job. So it's it's a balancing act. I, I think there'll be an election. They don't want it to happen, but there'll be an election. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we will win the election. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there was no other way I could have explained to our leadership and society students about the practice of leadership than to have brought someone who has, you know, not just been a scholar, but also been in the practice of leadership. Or to our governance of security students, that there is actually uh, a very robust intersection uh, between peace, conflict, and leadership. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Faye, for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to the students. I hope that uh, you felt it was worth it, given the quality of questions uh, that you got as well. But please allow us to invite you to drinks and continue the conversation for a short while more. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.